Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining this session. Uh, my name is Yang Guan, and I'm a software engineer working at Google. Uh, my work mainly focuses on making Kubernetes a better place to run multi-talented workloads. And today, I'm here to talk about uh, usage metering and fine-grained cost allocation in multi-talent Kubernetes clusters. So to know why we need to run a multi-tenant cluster, uh, imagine you work in the IT department of your company, and multiple teams within your company know Kubernetes is a, a great platform, and each of the team wants to have a Kubernetes environment. Uh, or your SaaS provider wants to use Kubernetes to host the workloads from your external customers or even you just have multiple microservices that you want to host and run in Kubernetes. What do you do? What options do you have? Uh, one, of the main, one of the options is to use what we call a multi-single talented model where you create a separate cluster for each of, your, uh, each of the party and use a cluster as a boundary. The other is to allow the multiple parties to share a single multi-talent cluster, use, for example, Kubernetes namespace as the talent boundary. While in certain cases, uh, a multi-single talent cluster do, does offer some advantages, such as better isolation, it comes at a cost. So for example, if you are manager more than 10 clusters, you might need to invest in tools for automatic, automatic cluster management, such as cluster creation, uh, upgrade and even deletion of uh, clusters simply because it's impractical to manage a huge number of clusters manually. And depending on your upgrade or patch policy, those clusters may end up in uh, different patch versions or even minor versions, causing different workloads to run in slightly different uh, environment. Secondly, with multiple clusters, you will need to have multiple control plan or masters, which is uh, extra overhead, and sometimes you do need to pay for these uh, uh, control plan resources. Uh, moreover, when you're running applications from different talent in different clusters that are by nature isolated from, like, from each other, you won't be able to use free or idle resources from one cluster to a different talent, causing high resource fragmentation and a low utilization. In comparison, when you have a single multi-tenant cluster, there is a better chance for you to do optimization, bin packing, uh, that improves the overall cluster utilization. Lastly, creating, for example, a Kubernetes namespace is usually much faster than bootstrapping a new cluster, which means you can provision an uh, environment to a new talent much more quickly. So how does it look like to share a Kubernetes cluster among multiple talents? In a multi-talent cluster, pods from different talents can share compute, storage, and network resources of a node. In addition, uh, cluster-level resources such as the remote storage, storage, or load balancers can be used by multiple talents. In Kubernetes, in general, a talent should just see the cluster as a shared pool of computer resources where uh, talent submit his workloads. Um, that workloads can be fit into your cluster and up and running. A talent doesn't need to care and shouldn't care about uh, the detailed resource the allocation and the consumption within a cluster, such as uh, where the pod is running, whether introducing extra replicas of uh, um, certain pods causes new nodes to be added into the cluster, or uh, what kind of network resources is provisioned for the workloads. But still, there are some people who really care about the resource usage within the a Kubernetes cluster and wants the visibility into resource usage. By, resource, by usage visibility, we need to know what resources are used by whom. 
more specifically, we wanted to understand how much resource is consumed by a given talent. So who cares about uh, such a visibility? If you are someone from the finance department, knowing the current per talent resource usage gives you important data point for planning, budgeting, and forecasting how much resources uh, you are going to need in the future. Um, additionally, remember that your company or someone needs to pay for the resources used by your cluster, which are usually include the cost for CPU, memory, storage, networking. And depending on where the cluster is hosted, you might also need to pay for the master resources as well. So it is of great interest to apportion the aggregated cluster cost to each individual talent sharing the cluster based on the talent resource usage and use the apportioned cost either for internal chargeback, shoeback, or as a basis to calculate billing for your external customers. In addition, if you are SRE or cluster admin, knowing the potent resource usage allows you to, for example, capture potential bugs. Uh, uh, an uh, example would be if the resource usage of a given, given talent suddenly increased by tenfold, that might mean there is an error in the workload specification. Or, if you also capture like the network uh, tra traffic usage, you can use it to make sure your application is uh, uh, well behaving, such that if you see something like a huge volume of data being sent to a foreign IP, you know, you know something goes wrong. Lastly, if you are an IT director or product manager, you can use the usage data to understand the resource usage trend whether my application is gradually consuming more resources, and use that to decide whether it's the time to lower the footprint of your application and perform, uh, invest heavily on like a resource optimization of your application. So knowing that, it is important to understand and getting visibility into the detailed resource usage, the missing Puzzle piece here in Kubernetes is the usage metering pipeline. Uh, we, wanted, we want such a pipeline so that we can keep a close eye on, uh, we can keep a close watch to report and monitor how cluster resources are used, namely CPU, memory, or even GPUs, storage, etc., and link the reported usage to Kubernetes native concept such as what are the CPU and the memory being used by a pod? What is the size of storage being requested by a persistent volume claim, whether the storage is a SSD or a regular disk? Why do we want to link the usage to Kubernetes concept? This is because it provides us a powerful, generic, and flexible way to further map usage to talent. So if you are using namespace as a talent boundary, you can just sum the reported CPU usage of pods in a given namespace, which tells you the aggregated CPU usage for the talent. Or if either namespace has multiple applications or a single talent spans across multiple namespaces, you can use Kubernetes labels to do more flexible usage grouping or filtering within a single namespace or across multiple namespaces across multiple namespaces, depending on your policy of managing uh, talents within the cluster. So how can we measure resource usage in Kubernetes? Luckily, with the declarative resource model used by Kubernetes, you can, ob you can obtain a lot of information from the Kube API server. For example, a pod usually requests how much CPU and memory is needed in the pod specification. So a, user, a usage metering component can set up a watch against a Kube API server and the report first when a pod is scheduled onto a node. How much CPU and memory does the pod, requ does the pod request? And lastly, the timestamp at which the pod is terminated. Of course, if you have like a long running pod, you can do something. If you have a long running pod that lasts 
for example, a few days, instead of generating usage records at the very end, uh, the usage metering component can break the overall lifetime into smaller chunks by reporting usage more frequently. And similarly, you can report usage for other resources, such as the storage and even, G even GPU. One of the missing pieces, or one of the missing information from the Kube API server is the network traffic statistics. We briefly mentioned this before. So, and there are several motivations to measure network traffic usage. So first of all, you can use network statistics to make sure your application is behaving correctly. If you see a sudden spike of data or traffic sent to an unknown region, there might be a bug, or worse, your application might be under attack. And secondly, on some platform, natural egress is not really free, so you wanted to capture how much data is sent from applications for each talent, from each talent for cost allocation purposes. And one of the option, one of the possible option uh, to capture and monitor network traffic is to deploy a network metering agent, monitoring agent onto each node and let the network monitoring agent talk with, uh, uh, for example, the contract table to check how many bytes are sent from pod and report the usage to the central usage monitoring component. Uh, I want to go a little, uh, I want to explain a little more on why we choose to measure resource request first instead of the actual usage or actual resource utilization, particularly for CPU and memory. So first of all, Cube Scheduler uses a resource request to decide where a part can be fit on a node. And once a pod is assigned to a node, Kube Scheduler considers the, the amount of CPU and memory being reserved for that pod, regardless how much CPU and memory is actually used by the pod. Also, Kube Scheduler will stop uh, assigning more pods to the node if uh, there's not enough unreserved resources available on the node. And uh, on the cluster level, if none of the nodes in the cluster has enough unreserved resources, uh, those unassigned pods will become pending, and it's the pending pods that drives, for example, cluster autoscaler to add more nodes into your cluster, which usually means it increases the cost of your cluster. And similarly, another factor is how resource coder works in Kubernetes. It constrains uh, it provides a per namespace limit on the aggregated resource request instead of the resource utilization. And based on these factors, we decided to first measure uh, resource request instead of actual resource utilization for CPU and memory. But we admit, utilization data is still very useful and relevant in this context. For example, utilization tells you how many resources are being consumed by best effort pods or booster pods? Burstable pods, those are pods that uh, either don't have resource requests being specified or occasionally use more resources than being requested. Uh, and having utilization data allows you to understand uh, the detailed application behavior uh, namely, what is the memory footprint over time, or is the CPU usage increase when a new version of your, for example, a new version of your code is being deployed. And lastly, the, for certain resources, the concept of request doesn't apply. An example is, uh, we can mention network egress, uh, network traffic or network bandwidth isn't a scheduler resources, schedulable resources within Kubernetes. So, uh, it doesn't have a, like a natural bandwidth request associated with that. So, once the resource usage data is uh, collected, one of the predominant use, use case is to use the data for, uh, for fine-grained cost allocation. Uh, so, cost allocation for dedicated resources is relative that is used by a single talent is relatively straightforward 
you know which tenant used the resource from the uh, user data, and you can directly allocate the relevant cost to that specific tenant. On the other hand, if you are allocating cost for shared resources, such as uh, uh, VM instances, it is uh, slightly more involved mathematically, but you can uh, apply some simple solutions, su such as linear cost allocation. For example, if the usage metering data uh, indicates a talent has a pod requesting 200 milli CPUs and uh, has been running for 60 minutes, and you know a single call VM costs you, for example, $1 per hour, you can just allocate 20 cents to, against that talent as a, cost of, as a CPU cost of, for the pod. And with that, uh, I'm happy to say that GKE now supports usage metering, uh, or Google Kubernetes Engine supports usage metering as a beta feature. Uh, you can enable it through the G Cloud command line tools, either when you are creating a new cluster or updating an existing cluster. Uh, the feature currently reports usage for several computer resources, such as CPU, memory, dynamic provision disks, or even GPUs and the network egress traffic. And we are continuously working on supporting more resources. And the reported usage is attached with the relevant Kubernetes namespace and, nam and the labels allowing you to do a flexible fine grained usage analysis. And this is how things work in, uh, in GKE. So once you enable this feature uh, for your GKE cluster, a usage metering agent is deployed onto the master node. Uh, the master node is uh, hidden from, from the user, so you, you won't be able to see it, but it generates a usage record by talking to the Kube API server and uh, sends the usage record to a BigQuery um, table specified by your cluster admin. Optionally, if you care about the natural usage, uh, a network monitoring agent is deployed into the cluster uh, as a daemon set. So there is a one part of the network metering agent running on each of your cluster nodes. Um, after the usage record are streamed to the BigQuery table, uh, the cluster admin can perform analysis uh, in BigQuery, such as generating uh, total CPU usage from a given namespace or the admin can join the usage with the billing data so that you can understand, for example, per namespace cost breakdown. Uh, the admin can also export the, uh, the data to other tools such as the, the data studio for visualization. Uh, with that, I would like to perform a demo. So this is a Google uh, cloud. Uh, this is the BigQuery uh, table. I, in, I enable the usage metering feature for one of my testing clusters. Uh, so uh, an agent get deployed into my uh, agent get deployed into my cluster and keeps sending data to BigQuery. And this is uh, what you're gonna see when you go to the console. You can see uh, what is the name of the cluster. Uh, which namespace does the uh, usage is generated from, uh, whether the uh, usage corresponds to CPU or uh, memory usage, uh, the time period from which the uh, time period from which the usage is generated from, and a few other things that are useful, such as like the labels or part that, uh, that generate such a usage. Uh, you, you can definitely uh, do certain queries within, uh, big, within BigQuery so that you can aggregate, filter, or grouping resources usage together to understand, uh, to understand the detailed resource usage within your cluster. But you, you can also populate the uh, usage data to BigQuery so that you can draw like meaningful graphs to visualize uh, the usage data. Uh, so in this example, we have pie chart uh, 
tells you like uh, how much cost is incurred from each of the namespace. Uh, and the like table in the middle tells you like uh, the detail, the, like the actual numbers of the, do the dollar numbers that corresponding to the cost generated from each namespace. Uh, the pie chart uh, on the left bottom basically breaks down the cost by resource type. And you can see within my cluster, uh, most of the charges are coming from the usage of CPU resources. Uh, the red portion is a uh, cost for memory resources, and there's a little, like a yellow portion that is the cost for network egress traffic. And on the bottom right, this gives you the cost trend from different namespaces uh, uh, over time. And you can actually see there is a nah, abnormal spike uh, from the staging namespace, and that was uh, due to an accidental error in which we, we scale a deployment by, by 10 times. So you can actually detect a certain like a misusage by looking at those cost breakdown data, which tells you whether my configuration is a, a crack or not. And that is the, the that concludes the demo, and also brings the, me to the end of my presentation. So just to wrap up, we talked about why we need to operate a multi-tenant cluster because it eases the cluster management and lowers the cost. We understand that in a multi-tenant cluster, pertinent per usage metering is important has, and has many use cases. For example, it allows you to monitor and forecast resource usage uh, detect abnormalous talent behavior, and last but not least, allocate aggregated cluster cost into pertinent basis or pertinent charges. Uh, we wanted to say usage metering is supported in GKE as a beta feature, and if you want to know more, the documentation is linked in the uh, is linked in the slide. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you very, very much for your time. Yeah, this is definitely something we are looking to. Uh, before we were sorting, we, we wanted to understand how other things work in different environments, like besides GKE, making sure the interface is generic, such that you can either join with the billing information from a different cloud provider, or you can specify your own price sheet so that we can, based on the price listed in the sheet, calculate cost for you. So that has been an ongoing discussion, and that's one of the reasons uh, I'm giving the presenting pre presentation here is to uh, hoping meet community members so that we can talk and design a more generic interface that can work across different env environments. Yeah, so I think CoreOS has a, like a uh, operator metering component, but uh, I think it's fetching data from promises, uh, but promises is not available on like uh, all of the like uh, platform, so. Yeah, so I think on certain platform uh, providers builds like a CPU and memory in two dimension, uh, but there are some like other instances that a VM is built as like a whole unit. So like from the billing, you see like a, a cost for a single VM instead of cost for CPU and memory individually. Uh, in that case, you might want to do mix match like a 
either by average the cost of CPU and memory together or do your like your own combination of two cost factors together. Yeah, that's a, that is a very good question, and the question is, uh, how do you apply discounts uh, for all these resources? Uh, you can also do something like a very simple or very complex. The simple solution is uh, if a discount comes in as a negative credit, you can do linear like a breakdown for those negative credit and apply the uh, linearize the cre credit towards the uh, namespace, for example. Uh, but depending on environment, sometimes the uh, credit, uh, like uh, from the cl cloud provider, the uh, the credit are not distributed uniformly across the VM inside a cluster. So uh, we see cases of people who just uh, want to aggregate and uh, aggregate the credit and apply it at cluster level, but we also see cases where people see some node is more important, so we only want to apply credit to those nodes, so that is more involved on like detecting where things are running, mapping it from usage to discount, and do you uh, get, a, like a, uh, get a, like a final result? Yes, there's a gentleman over there, like, I think we have a question for two, or we have time for two questions, so go ahead, please. Uh, hopefully, like, uh, uh, as I said, we are looking into options to eventually maybe open source it in the future, and after, like, one of the motivation to open source it would be to allow it to work across a different environment, and on-prem is definitely one of the environment that we, we all consider about. So. so did you say you're also doing actual utilization, not just request utilization? Uh, not right now, but this is, that is something we have been considering uh, to collect utilization data. Uh, one of the options is to uh, talk with the metric server, which I, have, which I think has been a standard like component running in Kubernetes and fetching data from there. But depending on your needs, right, metric server performs its own like aggregation averaging over a certain time period. So depending on how fast you wanted to detect the utilization, uh, there might be other alternatives to be considered. Yeah, yeah. But do you do it in production, like setting a really, really low request about allows it to go on definitely? So the question is about how it's tied with like functions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good question. Like related to that, like functions uh, usually. Uh, wants to do metering at a more fine grand timestamp, uh, we haven't uh, like uh, heavily investigated in supporting like functions uh, in Kubernetes, but that's something, that's a, that is definitely a good point, that's something we are interested to like uh, know more and uh, design a proper solution so that you can see uh, if the function like spies in like 10 milliseconds, milliseconds to capture like those usage in such a small timestamp. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you have a timeline for when uh, the GA is probably uh, Q1, Q2 next year. Uh, open sourcing has been an ongoing discussion. We haven't settled down on a concrete timeline yet. So the question is about how do you know which GPU is being used? Uh, I think it's, uh, we do have a, a 
So when you when pod request a GPU resources in the resource list, it specify like what's the type of resource being, what type of GPU being requested, and we can from there understand like what is being used. What, Like a specific GPU instance, uh, no, I don't think that's uh, uh, that information is included. Yes, but. Uh, we do consider the limit, but like internally within Kubernetes, request is more like the fundamental like a concept for resource allocation, right? So you can uh, so put it another way, like the summation of requests of all pods running on a single node can be much higher than the node capacity or node allocatable. That would be a uh, relatively strange like a situation if you do, for example, cost allocation based on that, right? So it seems like you are overusing a lot than what is actually available. All right, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks again for your time. Yeah, thank you.